Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ryan Heath, Senior Editor, Politico, Representative Michael Waltz, and Representative Ro Khanna. Welcome everybody. We're here to talk about geopolitics uh, after the fall of the Afghan government. Thank you so much, Congressman Waltz, sure. and also Congressman Khanna, um, both great members of the Armed Services Committee, so two very useful people to have for the conversation today. Um, I will get to Afghanistan and what we do there, uh, but I thought since everyone's been talking about the new defense partnership between Australia, UK, US, this submarine deal for days now, um, and that's clearly a power play against China, we need to start there. Mm -hmm. um, so Congressman Waltz, um, do we need more of this sort of deal making, even if the cost is hurt feelings in France, not the smoothest of trade relations, those sort of consequences? Or is there another way that we have to contain China? No, I, I commend the administration for taking this step, and I think it's an, a critical and an important step. Uh, the submarine aspect of it uh, is hugely important given China's naval buildup. Uh, the Chinese Navy is now larger than the United States Navy by ships. Obviously, they can concentrate theirs uh, in the South China Sea. Given their aggressiveness in the South China Sea and given their willingness uh, to use things like critical minerals, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and others for, for their geopolitical aims. And this, the submarine component is particularly important because of the massive ballistic missile buildup that we're seeing uh, in China that can put our carriers at threat, at distance. Obviously that's much more difficult with a submarine fleet. It's important to also state that it was broader than just submarines, although that grabbed the attention because uh, the French are, uh, are, are, are quite upset about their broken deal, but it was also importantly in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other types of technological sharing. So I, I commend the alliance. Uh, I commend the step. Uh, China is our greatest adversary. That is, I believe, in, in President Xi's own words, on a path to replace the American dream with the China dream. Uh, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to compete with that by being strong with our alliances. Uh, not only this AUKUS alliance, but the Quad alliance, which I know you want to talk about as yep. well. Yep. Um, love to bring you in now, Congressman Khanna. Um, what's the progressive take on this? Is it a zero-sum game where you have to ditch the French in order to turn to the Australians and the British in dealing with China? Or is there uh, another way that you want to see the administration tackle this? It's not a zero-sum game, but I think the administration did something completely appropriate. I mean, I don't really understand what France is doing with calling their ambassador. It's a free world. We're allowed to trade and have uh, agreements and purchases with other democracies. Uh, France lost out. We won. Uh, get over it. Uh, you know, I, I really don't understand how they're escalating a crisis for recalling the ambassador. If we had a deal we were making with another country and France won out, uh, I wouldn't recall the ambassador. I wouldn't recall them if they beat us in an Olympics competition. So uh, I think Macron needs to get over himself on this. <laughs> Fighting words. Um, the next stage in this alliance building is a meeting in the quad format in Washington in Friday. It's the chance to bring India into the discussion. Um, I'll now throw it back to you, uh, Congressman Waltz, as well, but a question for both of you. What role does India need to be playing now? They've been reluctant to uh, you know, take the side of the West in lots of different yeah. uh, debates and disputes. They're famously neutral, um, but clearly the US wants them on side with China. So what do they need to do to step up? What is the leverage to make them contribute more? Well, you know, I'll say this, I, Congressman uh, Khanna and I, when it comes to domestic politics, would struggle to find anything that we probably agree on as a proud conservative oh, we got some and, a, things. and a proud progressive. Yeah. But as but we are, we do both serve as the chair and co-chair of the U.S. India Caucus. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally believe it is perhaps the most consequential alliance the United States will have in the in the 21st century, diplomatically, economically, and certainly militarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a long way to go in the relationship, as you noted. Uh, when I worked in the Bush administration, I worked on the 123 agreement, uh, which I think historians will look back on the nuclear agreement mm -hmm. uh, with India as a real turning point in our relationship. Uh, I think there's a lot to flesh out in the Quad in terms of interoperability uh, when it comes to how our militaries communicate, how they move, uh, how they shoot. 
uh, and, and really establishing kind of a NATO type framework in terms of interoperability. I would love to see New Delhi stop buying Russian equipment mm -hmm. uh, and continue to develop their own and continue uh, to buy uh, NATO compatible equipment. But at the end of the day, I think Beijing did the relationship a huge favor. Uh, Xi is overreaching quite aggressively from the South China Sea to Hong Kong and then, of course, on the Indian border. Uh, uh, my sense is that that's really galvanized uh, all sides of the political spectrum in New Delhi. I look forward to the relationship continuing to advance. Uh, I do have to say, which I know we're gonna talk about Afghanistan, uh, this reckless debacle uh, that we've just undergone uh, in Afghanistan leaves our ally India in a horrific position. China now has a new ally with its China, Pakistan, Taliban axis. Yep. Uh, and the first place you're going to see the $80 billion of night vision, body armor, heavy weaponry, I fear is with the Haqqani and Taliban's best friend, Lashkar-e-Taiba, in the Indian Kashmir. Yep. Uh, and so they're incredibly alarmed. Uh, and my fear, my ultimate fear is that Afghanistan doesn't just evolve into a civil war, it could evolve into a regional proxy war a la Syria mm -hmm. with the Indians, Pakistanis, uh, Iranians, Russians, Chinese, and all of their various constituent groups in Afghanistan mm -hmm. on various sides with $80 billion of American equipment arming everyone. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Khanna, to, to join those thoughts up then, how do we have India step up from the sidelines? They, they have a lot of self-interest, as Congressman Waltz just pointed out. Um, to, to do more now in the quad format, uh, but also it can be argued that they like that the US, Australia, UK play bad cop while they don't have to sort of take on that heavy lifting. Um, how can we get them to do the heavy lifting and is Afghanistan one of the motivations? First, let me uh, give uh, Congressman Waltz credit under the Bush administration. I disagreed with a lot of uh, President Bush's foreign policy, but one area where he did make a historic uh, achievement uh, was with the Indian nuclear deal. It uh, helped transform the relationship between the United States and India as a strategic partner. I know Congressman Waltz worked on it. I know uh, Nick Burns worked on it, who is now our ambassador to China, and I hope we can get him confirmed because he's still languishing just as a nominee. We need to send him to China. I think there should be bipartisan consensus on that. The, the relationship, I think, is premised on two very simple facts. India uh, is a pluralistic democracy. Now, they've had challenges with pluralism. The more pluralistic they are in respecting different faiths, different cultures, which was Gandhi and Nehru's original vision, the more aligned they are uh, with our uh, sense of pluralism in our democracy. And second, they believe in markets, and they believe in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, and so do we. And I think that model of pluralism a liberal democracy, uh, on a free enterprise, uh, is the correct model for human civilization in the 21st century. And that's ultimately the source of our relationship. Now, you can't expect that the U.S.-India relationship is going to be uh, like the U.S.-U.K. relationship, given that U.K. had colonized India for 200 years. And uh, partly the non-aligned movement in India stemmed as a reaction to, to colonialism. But it's now 75 years since independence, and I think that they are coming you know, into their own and understanding that uh, they can't be non-aligned between democracy and authoritarian uh, authoritarianism. And I do believe that India, partly because of the Indian American community here, uh, will ultimately align with the United States and our, our values. Absolutely. Now let's dive into Afghanistan. We've got six minutes left. Um, I'll throw it back to you, Congressman Khanna. Um, is China now going to sweep in and reap all the benefits of two trillion dollars and 20 years of war that the West has waged in Afghanistan, and how do we stop them, if you think that is the case? No, if China wants to get bogged down in an endless war in Afghanistan, uh, go right ahead. I mean, I'm glad that we're out of there. I'm glad that we're not spending trillions of dollars there. I'm, I'm glad that our uh, troops aren't being put in harm's way there. I think withdrawal was the correct decision. And we can now invest that money in making sure we're winning in science and AI and the space race and synthetic biology and clean technology and all of the things that are gonna make us more competitive than China. And ultimately why I believe we will win 
in the 21st century is that we have people from around the world, the best and brightest. China does it. We're an immigrant nation. If you want to have the best product, the best research, we can find the best person anywhere in the world. And China doesn't have that same advantage. So that's what I think we ought to focus on instead of getting caught up in an endless war in Afghanistan. And are you worried as a quick follow up? Um, clearly, the situation for women and minorities is worse now that the Taliban's in control. Um, does it worry you that that is one of the results of the policy you supported of getting out? Or is it something that just has to be dealt with over time? I'm deeply concerned about human rights. But if you read Anand Gopal's piece in The New Yorker, you will real, I think he writes very compellingly that uh, under the Ghani regime, human rights were being violated in rural Afghanistan. So yes, the situation has been worse in Kabul. And we need to use every sanction uh, in our uh, disposal to make sure the Taliban are recognizing human rights. But you know, you had General Saadi organ uh, ordering the killing in these villages of civilians, including many women uh, there. And 70% of Afghanistan is rural. So I don't think that we can have a uh, one view of women's rights uh, in Afghanistan. It's a much more complicated uh, picture. And there weren't many good actors other than the United States. Um, Congressman Waltz, I'd love for you to respond if you want to to any of that. But also now that the Afghanistani resistance has been defeated, um, what next? You're vehemently opposed to recognizing or funding the Taliban. Right. But how do we grapple with the reality that they control Afghanistan now? Yeah, and, and with respect to my friend, uh, to, to Ro Khanna, I think equating a, uh, the constitutionally elected, far from perfect, uh, record under the government when the Taliban controlled much of the rural areas uh, in, in this ongoing conflict to the gross and ongoing and abysmal, uh, uh, just devastating and despicable human rights abuses that are going on right now, right as we sit here in our comfortable room, uh, where women are being be uh, beaten. I've had a, an interpreter get beheaded in front of his family where the Taliban are using our own databases to hunt down those who stood for our values and stood with freedom against extremism. I just think it is wish list, it's wishful thinking. Uh, yes, of course, we want to end endless wars. And yes, of course, we want to bring troops home. I also want to end world poverty. I mean, that's just a throwaway talking point. What no one can then explain to me is how we contain a terrorist threat that clearly, and the intelligence community is very clear on this, the UN is very clear on this, intends to attack the West again. The Taliban equals Al-Qaeda, period. The head of Al-Qaeda, Ayman Zawahiri, Osama bin Laden's deputy, has pledged fealty and loyalty to the head of the Taliban. Is uh, Siraj, Siraj Haqqani is, I mean, he is, may as well be Charles Manson and John Gotti, uh, you know, combined. Uh, he is so now we, determining. We don't, we don't negotiate with Charles Manson <laughs> or the Afghan equivalent. Absolutely not. Yep. Absolutely not. We stand for the rule of law. We stand for a constitution that was democratically developed. Again, far from perfect. Many are. Uh, and, uh, and I do think you will continue to see a resistance to this type of authoritarian rule. Uh, has the administration boxed themselves and boxed us into a horrible position? Uh, look, yes, uh, this is a disaster from a human rights standpoint. It's a disaster for our credibility. Uh, I, one can only uh, imagine what our allies in Taiwan and Ukraine are thinking right now as Russia and China breathe down their neck. And it's a disaster from a counterterrorism standpoint. Look, we had to go back into Iraq to clean up the mess of ending the endless war in 2011 when Obama pulled us out of Iraq and we led to the rise of the ISIS caliphate and attacks across the world. But when we went back, we had bases, we had local allies in the Kurds, and we fortunately did not allow ISIS to take over the Baghdad government. Now we have no bases. We've given them away. Our local allies are being hunted down. Okay. Uh, and we have, an army's worth, we have an army's worth of equipment that we've essentially given them. Future American soldiers are going to die dealing with this, not be saved. Uh, I think it's just an Congress absolute Mankana, reckless problem. Um, if I could just uh, respond, I, I think the strategic blunder was George W. Bush when the Taliban wanted to surrender to him. And he refused to accept their surrender. That was the blunder. And okay. then we had general after general lying to the Congress saying we were winning. We but were we winning. are where we are now. We're are we going to Taliban. recognize them? And, are we going you know, to go so back you had in? the Bush original mistake of refusing to have the surrender. You had generals misleading the Congress. And you had President Biden finally say, look, we're going to get out. Bro, the Taliban bro, I, wrote a, I wrote a whole book on the mistakes back. that we made. 
I wrote a whole the, book the on Taliban the mistakes that we made, and, and we were there, and we the made The Taliban many. knows that like we will go forward. back with, with huge force. But if you look at history, it will be very clear that George W. Bush will be seen as having made a strategic blunder in Iraq, a strategic blunder in Afghanistan, and it's taken Barack Obama and Joe Biden to restore our credibility, to bring our troops home, to protect our lives. And the Taliban should be under no illusion. We will strike if they harbor any terrorism or if there's Time a is unfortunately threat. up, but can I take it that you both support more accountability about what happens next in Afghanistan? There is going to be further inquiry in Congress. We can't stick our head in the sand and wish this problem away, and that's exactly what this administration's doing. Uh, and we've made a lot of mistakes, fully admit them, wrote a book about it, but going forward, and you know, we may pretend we're done with Afghanistan, but it's not done with us, and that cancer will spread and follow us home, and there will be accountability for that. One final word to you, Congressman Connor. There needs to be accountability, and I'm not saying that everything that was done in the withdrawal was perfect. There needs to be accountability, but there has to be accountability for the, the last 20 years. And I do appreciate uh, Congressman Waltz's service to our country. The one thing we can all agree on is anyone who wore the uniform, who served, uh, did so honorably, and, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and it's now time for the next session. All right. Thank you so much.